Welcome to Toy Train Review 2. We have another great show for you. Layout stories include a Southwest-inspired high-rail layout, a multi-level toy train layout, and a realistic layout that includes toy train accessories. We also visit an impressive O-scale layout that includes some custom-built steam locomotives. Roger Farkash provides tips on adding realistic ground cover. And the Lone Star High Railers Club have built an impressive layout inside a vintage baggage car. Some operators feel the Century O-gauge switches were better than Lionel's. We take a look. Robert Suarez of Texas finally has his dream layout, but it took many years before the fantasy became a reality. I got started with Lionel Trains at the age of uh, four or five, I would say. My dad was a train buff and he started collecting uh, when he was a boy and that started the love of trains, so that was 50 years ago. And ever since and I've been in the hobby and kind of building a collection over the years with my with the with the help of my dad and it's been a common hobby and a bond between us. Never lost track of the hobby even when I was going to college if there'd be a train show I would go to the train show uh, it, it's not something that just stopped because I went to college and it's been it's been a hobby my whole life. We designed the house the room it was really important to me probably as important as any part of the house that and I also collect antique cars so my garages were very important in fact the rest of the house was somewhat uh, more important to my wife and my rooms were most important to me right down to the lighting in the rooms and this room which is roughly 25 by 40 started out at 20 by 30 and then we kept making it bigger and bigger the house was built and designed to have this layout I absolutely knew that I wanted to hire somebody because I didn't have the time to build something like this. Um, I had been to a couple of train shows and ran into uh, Roger Farkash and, and TW Design. Roger took me around and showed me other layouts that he had built in the area. It took me to oh, four or five different gentlemen that had beautiful layouts and I was just totally impressed with what I saw and then that's when I decided to go ahead and move forward and then we started the design process with Roger. In hiring Roger to build this, uh, I felt for me it was the best thing to do because I wanted to get it done. And with my businesses and my time constraints, uh, raising a family uh, and everything else I have going on in my life, if I had started to build it myself, we wouldn't be talking because it still would be sitting here in the rough. This is the first chance I've had to really have the full-blown layout having built this uh, type of a layout here where you know I could come home on any given night after work and and operate the layout so from that perspective yes an operator but um, but probably through the years more of a collector because I didn't have the ability to set up a big layout uh, it takes it takes space so right now at this point I would say I'm more just running the layout walking around looking at it um, now as time goes, I will be doing more operating because I have to learn it. I mean, it's a technical education to try to run this layout. It's not difficult. You just have to learn all the ins and outs of it. It's very clear. You can actually look at a diagram of the layout and know which switch you're pressing. But when you're on this side of the layout and you're pressing a switch that is on the other side of the mountain, you have to become familiar with the layout and know which switch does what because this is a full operational layout with, with uh, two big switch yards. We've got uh, three ZW transformers that we use. It is operated by command control. You can still run the, the uh, layout manually if you want to, although everything that you buy nowadays is all command control. And it's kind of nice with this big of a layout to be able to walk around because if you were just using the manual ZW transformers, you can't see if a train's derailed on the other side or you really can't even see where it's at because of the mountains. 
and my son actually has probably a better working knowledge at this point than I do with the remote controls. So that's a good thing because my son will probably be showing me how to work a lot of this, kind of like we do with the, uh, the cell phones and the, all the gadgets today. The track that we used was Ross track. I was not that familiar with what type of track to use, and then I went to Roger and said, what is the best type of track you can buy that has, that has good uh, longevity, you know, looks realistic, and another factor is quiet. And so anyhow, he, uh, he was the one that was instrumental in, in steering me that direction, and, uh, and I love the track. It, it's the most realistic track I've ever seen, at least in my opinion. Among the realistic scenery and track are toy train operating accessories. We've got, oh, I've never really counted, but there's probably you know, 25 or 30 different areas or stations, if you will, where a person can walk up, they can press a button, and one of the sheds will whistle. There's a remote control on the other side to remove tractor trailers, maxi stack from the, from the, uh, from the cars. So it's, it's a little bit of both. It's not something where you just come out go to the layout and just watch the trains go around. Th that was one of the things that Roger uh, mentioned to me. He said, if you, if you want to have a layout where people are going to go up there and be interested and you know, not, not just be there for five minutes and get bored, have it where it's interactive with, with the folks that are there. I have different sections. Um, I wanted a carnival area, and that's I call this kind of the uh, state fair or the carnival area in this section. And then when you go around the corner, I've got a, an actual working yard. And then down in the middle of the layout, down low, we built a area where you have a train running down low. And my son likes Thomas the train. And um, so we, we actually run that down there. That's kind of his little area. And then at the same time, I wanted to incorporate the old downtown look of the town that we, we vacationed in Michigan. Roger mentioned early on that you know they built scale models of Union Station so I went ahead and incorporated that into the layout too which is on the front. As far as the elevated sections I wanted to have mountain scenes and I wanted to have trains that would climb the mountains I thought that was really neat and in reverse and that's the nice thing about this layout is you can reverse the direction of the trains because it does get monotonous if you're going the same direction all the time so when you take a long diesel locomotive and you go through the mountain scene and then reverse it, it looks completely different coming out one end of the tunnel versus going in. We also did in this layout, I wanted a mining scene on one of the mountains and we did that on the back side of one of the mountains too. Um, at the same time, having gone to Colorado and liking snow-capped mountains, I wanted to have some snow that was on the top of the mountains so Roger incorporated that and made it look like, you know, up the upper elevations we had some snow, which is kind of neat. In addition to the model trains, Robert has a nice collection of Railroadiana, including signs, switch lanterns, and signals. Robert also has a collectible Lionel service station neon clock. The reason I think Lionel has such a large emotional following is because Lionel has been around for many, many, many years. And I think there's a lot of people that are my age that are, that are baby boomers that had a train set, a Lionel train set as, as a child. And back at that time, um, you had Lionel, you had Marks. There really wasn't, like today, there's a lot more manufacturers. So I think that was pretty much it. And, and I always remember as, as a young child, having a Lionel train under the Christmas tree was just, was like, you know, the cat's meow. It was, it was a great thing. So it, it, it's, it's an American icon in my opinion. I'm pretty much a, a loyal customer of Lionel. I like their product. I think their product is, is technologically really advanced. The only drawback I see to Lionel is that sometimes you order something and it might be a year and a half later before you get it, and that's frustrating. So you get this catalog, you get excited about it. Well, it takes six months to a year and a half to get here, or sometimes not at all. Now. You know, I understand with business they have to have a certain amount of orders, but they really shouldn't put it in the catalog, you know, put it out there for the public to buy if it's not really available. Oh yeah, I am, I am completely satisfied. Uh, probably the only thing that I wish I had done was to make it bigger, but you know, that's true with anything. I, I, I could have built something twice this size if I had the real estate, but 
um, that means we probably have to move out because it's, uh, you know, there's only so much room in this house. And how does Mrs. Suarez feel about the trains? Um, you know, she's not a big train buff. I mean, she's happy for me that it's my hobby. But she, she comes up here. She enjoys it for, uh, for what it is and the fact that I have it and I love it. It's a, it's a hobby and, you know, it's kind of my little man cave, so to speak. Throughout Robert's journey in the hobby, his father Joseph has maintained an active role, even after his passing. My dad was very instrumental in me getting into this hobby. I wanted to dedicate the layout to my dad uh, in, in loving memory of my dad because he was an integral part of this layout and, and was so helpful over the several, several years that I designed it with ideas and thoughts. and. Many, many times when we were in the design process, I would call him and what do you think? And then I would mail some plans to him or email something to him and he would look at it and he would say I would do this or I would do that. There's a lot of different things that remind me of him in this layout because it, his ideas were, you know, were, were part of this layout. And now just as his father did for him, Robert is passing down his love of toy trains to his son. He's 12 years old and he's just at that point where I was when I first really, really got involved with model trains. He just loves to come up here and look and, and, and just all the, it's like he goes into his own little world when he walks around and looks at the little, the little areas or the different sections of the train layout that are, that are, uh, that are operating. Everyone is familiar with the O22 O gauge switches made by Lionel. There were also the O72 switches for wide radius turnouts. When post war Lionel was at the height of its popularity, a Chicagoland store called Hearth Hobbies developed and sold what they called the Century Switch. Collector and operator John Palm explains. This switch probably grew out of a need for adults in the post-war period to have to play with trains. While Lionel's product was rugged enough to be a toy, it really appealed to a lot of adults as well. This wide radius switch was compatible with Lionel tubular track and could be used for diverging routes on the main line. But the century switches were best utilized connecting two parallel tracks which allowed for closer proximity, four and three quarter inches between the center rails. The century switches were also useful in creating yards. In looking at the standard Lionel switch, one sees the complex network of guides and contact strips designed to keep the flanges tight against the outer rails and provide uninterrupted power to locomotives traveling through. The muddy design is punctuated by a fat center rail located between the swivel rail assembly. By contrast, the century switch has a much simpler, cleaner appearance. The swivel rails are longer and insulated from each other. As one of the swivel rails guides a train in a certain direction, the other acts as the center rail, providing power to the train. When the switch is activated, the swivel rails trade functions with the other swivel rail now guiding the train and the remaining swivel rail now acting as the center rail. The functioning center rail in absence of complicated network of guides allowed a clear path for contact shoes mounted under the trucks and smooth passage for wheels and center pickup rollers. Hearth boasted that trains could cruise through their switches going 100 scale miles per hour. Marks incorporated a similar design in several of their switches as well. Those, of course, are used with O27 track. Though an improvement in many areas, the century switches were not perfect. The coils were very small because they had to fit them underneath the profile of the switch. And they took a lot of energy to switch, too. They took a lot of amperage-wise. And uh, if they got old and dirty, after, even after a few years, uh, the coils become overheated. Operators using tin plate track today aren't aware of the century switches partly because they were manufactured only for a few years. 
the century switches were a big asset, but they were made for a very short period of time. As far as I can tell, they only started around 52 at the earliest, and they were all manual. They weren't electrified until 54, and I think they were off the market by 56 or 57. We've talked a lot about O-scale layouts, but we've never done a story on one, until now. Welcome to Bill Leiter's O-scale layout. We'll start with Bill explaining the main differences between O-scale and high rail. The third rail is primarily the difference in the larger flanges and the larger couplers. I'm almost certain that if I was in three rail, high rail, that I would go to prototype couplers and prototype wheels and weather my equipment. It would give me more satisfaction, that's why. The name of the hobby is having fun and enjoying yourself and a feeling that you've accomplished something that makes your enjoyment more. A lot of uh, fellows that are in O-Scale started out with uh, toy trains, HO and Lionel and American Flyer and all of that stuff and just gradually got into more prototypical railroading and graduated into a scale. I do believe though that there is a place for that and I honor people that are into it and I thank God for them being in it because it promotes more sales and promotes more building and equipment available. So in the long run, I'm glad there's people that like three rail. It's not for me, but uh, there's nothing wrong with it at all. And there's nothing wrong with toy trains. Uh, it's just a different aspect of the model, of the hobby. Over the years, when I first started out in HO, there was prototypical equipment that I wanted to make into models that was not available. And so consequently, I started building my own stuff. One of the first steam engines that I scratch built in O scale was the uh, Union Pacific Thief 3. Thief meaning 484, F E F. And it's a northern. That particular locomotive fascinated me because it was the last steam locomotive built for the Union Pacific and it was never retired. In recognition of Bill's unique talent, the NMRA has named him a master model railroader. Other scratch built models include this H1. It was a, a locomotive that was inspired by my childhood because when I was a young a lad of about nine years old or 10, I went with my mother's father, my grandfather, out to the West Coast. The engine that pulled us from the Chicago Northwestern Station to Omaha, Nebraska, or Council Bluffs, Omaha, Nebraska area, was the H1. And then from there, they put on the Northern, which I have built, the UP Northern, FIF 3. That pulled us out to uh, Denver, and from Denver to the West Coast, we had Challengers pulling our train. Uh, so that very, it's nostalgic for me in that sense. Yeah, that was the reason that I built that. Scratch building when I was young to me used to mean taking and putting together almost uh, a box car, or, and painting it and stuff, which is just kit building. But true scratch building is where you start from the beginning and work from there. And by the beginning, I mean, in my case, I would start from the prototype. And uh, if drawings aren't available of the prototype, I would make them myself, being a commercial artist. 
a, a draftsman and an engineer and an electrical engineer. I can do this. Railroading involves uh, electronics, carpentry, draftsmanship, artistic work, both 3D and 2D. I, I love the machining and the mechanics of it. I love to machine things, whether it would be out of brass or out of steel or out of bronze or out of copper or out of uh, aluminum. Um, I love to machine metal and I love to work with wood and I love to work with plastic, any kind of materials. I build passenger cars out of plastic, I build them out of wood, I build them out of brass, I build them out of paper, Strathmore paper, ply, uh, three ply, four ply, and laminate together to uh, reinforce. I don't know if you realize it, but before rocketry, the most complicated machine that man ever made was the steam engine. To me, in modeling, there's a cutoff, <laughs> shall we say. We don't want to make it so that it looks like it's, it's completely covered with dirt and filth so you can't see the markings on it. But I use different techniques for weathering. I Sometimes I will take a uh, brush that is a, uh, made of what is it? fiberglass, a fiberglass erasure brush and I will rub down the sides of a boxcar or a reefer and that will dull the paint and streak it like it does when it weathers from rain and snow and soot and stuff and it'll lighten it and then I'll also uh, airbrush dirt and stuff where it flies up from the trucks onto the side of the car near the bottom and I'll weather the roofs because of rain will get on the roofs and wash the paint off uh, eventually or lighten it to the point to where the paint fades after a few years. All of that adds to realism of the equipment that you're operating and makes the whole situation look more realistic. This railroad that I model, it takes place in 1950. So consequently, the cars are from 1950 or earlier. There's nothing after 1950 that runs on the railroad. This is not a layout comprised of randomly placed stations and scenery. The display represents a specific time period located in a specific region. As we enter the railroad, this scene takes place in uh, Utah, and this is part of Weber Canyon, heading westbound in this area on the Union Pacific. And uh, as we come to the bridge here, this is Weber River, pronounced Weber in this area and spelt like Weber. Those rocks are plaster castings and then I just colored them with uh, acrylics. People would come in, feel them to see if they were real rock or ask me if they were real rocks. As we progress to the end of uh, Weber Canyon, we come across a oil refinery that is located just north of Salt Lake City and just south of Ogden, Utah. As we turn north, we come into Union Station at Ogden, Utah. This is one of the main stays of the Union Pacific, and uh, this is uh, taking place in June of 1950, as it was then. We go north up into McCammon, Utah, at the border of Utah and lower Idaho. And we go through the Portanuff River Valley and into the mountains and out into the valley where Pocatello is. Pocatello was the headquarters of the OSL, which was the Oregon Short Line that was a subsidiary of the Union Pacific. And the station is still standing today and is used as a division point on the Union Pacific. 
The um, icing platform here indicates a small portion of the actual icing platform that was in the northern end of Pocatello and was used through the 1960s when they were taken over by mechanical reefers. This is the actual roundhouse that was at Pocatello. The roundhouse here indicates how it looked at McCammon and Pocatello and other areas of the Union Pacific. The coaling tower uh, depicts uh, the coaling tower and the gantry crane that was used there also. The turntable is a Pratt & Whitney turntable and was built for the Union Pacific and can handle a big boy and any engine smaller, of course, and was uh, removed in about the 19, late 1960s. The river depicted here is the Port Nuff River that runs through Pocatello and runs into the mountain area of southern Idaho. We come around the corner here and get into Sun Valley where the skiing was, took place in the wintertime and fun place for the summer uh, activities. From Shoshone, we travel westward and come around the corner here into Mountain Home, which is near the border of Idaho and Eastern Oregon. From Mountain Home, which is in the western end of Lower Idaho, we go into the Idaho Mountains, the Blue Ridge Mountains near uh, Huntington, Oregon, uh, where the division ends and then goes under the steps, which indicates its way into the west coast at Portland. We've seen how dedicated Bill is in creating realistic trains and scenery, so it should come as no surprise that he applies the same standards to his track. Primarily, I used Atlas three-foot track that has ties and rail on it. And I would lay it down and paint the ties, each one separately, and the tie plates separately, and the sides of the rails, and ballast it to make it look realistic. You can't have uh, dips in the rail going up, or you'll cause derailments, or if they go down, you'll cause derailments too, because the uh, cars will not ride on the rails and uh, they'll derail. So your rail has to be front to back exactly straight and top and to bottom straight and right to left straight. They have to line up perfectly or as perfect as humanly possible and use rail joiners to keep them together and solder the areas where the rail joiners go. You lay your track down on, I used three quarter inch plywood for the top of my layout between the track and the plywood is a road bed and I used cork road bed. That's a sound deadener, it helped out. The track is laid on top of that, weathered and then ballasted last. Probably a minimum radius, a minimum radius in O scale for steam and diesel would be five feet radius. That's 10 foot diameter. Better Minimum would be six feet, 12 foot diameter. It makes the passenger cars run and look better because you have 85 foot passenger cars. That's enough. You were asking about uh, high rail before. Generally in high rail, they have tighter radiuses and they'll shrink the passenger cars down from 80 foot to 60 feet, a lot of them. Uh, that would be unacceptable in O scale. So three railers. Are you thinking about making the jump into two rail O scale? Bill has some advice for you. My advice is to not try and chew off too big of a bite. It's an enormous project. And if you don't have a lot of room, you still can build a switching layout, or you can still build a small layout. By that I mean maybe 20 feet by 20 feet 
instead of 47 feet by 48 feet like this one is. Start small. You can always enlarge it, but if you start with too large of a project and you don't have a lot of help, it gets overburdening. This railroad is not complete yet. The scenery on uh, by Union Station there by Ogden. And I've been working on it for 20 some years. Bill enjoys the enthusiastic support of friends and family, especially from his wife, Stephanie. My wife appreciates the fact that I have an interest in trains and uh, likes the fact that I build things and make them and put them on the railroad to run. And she enjoys the uh, idea of things that I make running on the railroad almost as much as I do. She thinks that it's a wonderful hobby. All of the layouts that we build are built on a substrate uh, surface and then a styrene type foam that we use for not just the sound deadening uh, insulation for the noise between the track and the uh, wood surfaces that are underneath it, uh, but also it gives us the ability to change the terrain. So we're not just a single flat surface, but we have the opportunity to carve into that uh, surface down to a full one inch is what we use uh, as standard. As we've coated the entire surface with uh, paint, gray umber, a lamp black, and burnt umber, so we get that rocky texture going on. Right now it has some gloss to it. Um, it's always best to use like a semi-gloss um, or even an eggshell, but don't use flats because when you apply different colors on top of the flat, there's enough tooth to the flat paint that it'll just suck that uh, glazing color on, into it and just muddy it all up. But we know that we have what looks or appears to be like a roadway or access to the area. So the basic ingredient we use is white glue. Elmer's white glue or some of the other uh, railroad type supply houses have different uh, elements. We find the white glue to be very successful. All right, so quickly getting some glue on the surface that will then be spreading around. You'll notice that I'm brushing up to the base of the rockwork here. So I want to get a little bit of the, the rock fall uh, along the edge of uh, the cliff, if you will, or a little uh, rock protuberance that we have, Con kind of controlling the amount and placement of these elements to give it a, a natural look first. That's the most important thing. And then we want to introduce some other colors along the right of way. And you notice I'm picking up on the grays and browns that we initially had in our paint application. Now, as I'm sprinkling it, you'll notice that I've kind of been reluctant to get a lot here. That's because I want to add a weed in that area. We also know we have a, a pathway. Uh, we expect to see a little pathway in here. And I'm just going to try to be very careful when I apply my sand. A spoon re really works well in uh, these instances. All right, now some, some of those grasses. I use different colors of grasses as well. The fibers themselves go through a screen. As they pass through the tube, they're electrically charged. Uh, we have a ground wire in the table. They're being charged in a positive uh, manner as they go through the tube. So uh, that reaction, uh, you're electrically charging the uh, particles of grass, and as they fall, uh, they tend to line up between the, the ground, the negative ground, and the positive charge in the tube. Uh, so you can actually see the fibers are standing up. And once you've uh, put some grass in, once you've added uh, uh, some of the ballast, some of the sands, you may see some areas where you need to punch it up a little bit more. I can see where my uh, uh, pathway has gotten pretty heavy with the glues. Uh, all you have to do is come back over with a little bit more of the sand uh, to reinforce what you did earlier. Um, it'll compress over the uh, grass or allow some of the grass to come through. Um, a lot of it is revealed as you 
uh, get to the uh, final step, which is basically removing everything that didn't stick. Uh, we do that by vacuuming. Uh, I'm going to replace a few of those little clumps that I think uh, would be nice to maintain. The final thing that I tend to do is when it's all dry and it's just the way I want it, the semi-gloss and the glue have a little bit of a sheen to it, so I use a dull coat. Uh, it's actually a spray paint, if you will, a clear coat that seals everything down and also dulls it down, so it gives it a flat, natural appearance. When you want to change an area, you just soak it with warm water and then use a, uh, like a putty knife or scraper, and you can scrape off uh, that surface, uh, the compositions that you put on top of it, and there's enough paint uh, with enough gloss there. If you don't let it on, st stand on the surface too long, you'll be able to just pull off what you applied on, and you can rework that surface. It's great if you want to experiment and um, find out uh, uh, what works, what, what doesn't work for you, um, but again, I think that's a quick demonstration of just how you can change up the surface and how easy it is to do. Bill Taylor got started with trains in 1961 when he was given a Boston and Maine Elko with some military and space cars. He played with them constantly. I ran it around the living room until the helicopter rotors finally broke off from hitting the ceiling so many times. He became a highly skilled missile launcher. The missile shot across the room, hit the side of the boxcar, and we had spring-loaded. The top and the two sides would blow up. It took a lot of tries. <laughs> a lot of tries. Jump ahead a few years, and Bill has this 28 by 28 foot room in the basement of his summer home near Sister Lakes, Michigan. So he decided to build a layout. One obstacle was the staircase in the middle of the room. What do you do with something you can't do anything about? You ignore it and go ahead and build your layout. The stairway divides the room in half. On one side are the mountains, trestle bridge, and farms, and on the other side, the city. On the outside tracks, I'm running about 150 linear feet of train on the top two tracks about the same on the lower track. It's kind of a dog bone, runs out, runs around the stairs, comes back through the mountain, and then loops back around. Got my city, my two tracks on the inside of the city going around. I basically set up my layout to have a city and then to have mountains. Again, Western Michigan is all farms, so I thought I'd like to have some farms and some train stations uh, where the trains would stop. I will take ideas that I've seen on your videos and thought, well, that looks good. I would like to recapture that. But mostly, I just build. It was flat, then I added the second level, and then I added the level underneath, and then I merged the two sides together. This nine-foot-long trestle bridge was built from scratch. Had all kinds of one-by-sixes, one-by-eights, different lengths, and I ran them through on my table saw. And then I bought a planer, and I planed them all at 5 sixteenths. The piers, the straight pieces that go up and down, I built them individually and began just setting them, balancing pieces of wood on top until I got where they, where they needed to be in order to connect from mountain to mountain. And then I glued them together one piece at a time. And once I got them stationary and got some of these longer pieces glued in, then I could fill it in with other ones. Then I had this whole section, nine feet, took it outside and spray painted it with flat enamel spray paint. The mountain was built the old fashioned way. Formed it with chicken wire and pieces of one by four, glued it all together, stapled it all in, formed it, bought a 50 pound bag of flour and started mixing it up with water and newspaper. It laid all the newspaper on the mountain to get the shape I began gluing all the different shapes of molds on there and then began staining them. Just kind of carved it out as I put it on and that's how I got the shape of the mountain. The 
Most of this track is the flex track. Most of the curves are 72, so I can get the nice sweeping curves. The layout is powered by mostly MTH Z4000s. I have three of those that are running. Then I have an original Lionel ZW that's tucked under the stairs. Lighting in my city is split between about six or seven transformers. I've got seven trains, two S gauge and five O gauge run at one time. Bill uses S gauge to create the perception of greater distance. It's a little higher and it's the optical illusion that it's farther away. And I like S gauge. It's just a little bit smaller than O. I like the way it looks. It's a smaller area up there, so I had to run a little smaller track. I couldn't have run O up there. To minimize the possibility of crack-ups, the trains run mostly on independent loops. Switches get you in trouble. I had some derailments today because the switches will all of a sudden just vibrate and open up, and when that happens, disaster occurs. But normally they're, they're all independent. I'm not into the digital command system. The more complicated, the more problems. And if you, you're not running it, then you know why buy it? And I'm satisfied with everything I have. I have 15, 16 different engines, and I have seven tracks, so I can easily change out engines. And I got plenty of box cars. I can run box cars, freight. I can run passenger. I have the variety. I can just come down, sit, and relax, and listen to trains. I bought a big bag of ballast. It's a different crushed rock and stone. And then my brother-in-law kind of turned me on to mixing lizard litter, dried coffee grounds, and then sand from our beach. And that's how I made some of my paths. And then the scenery is different types of grass, a lot of trees. I like the color trees, the fall trees. And I, I love my little hobos. I got hobo campfires in a couple places. When I was a kid, I got in 4-H. In the wintertime, I had electrical and woodworking. So every year for several years, I'd either make a table, I'd make a lamp, I'd do electrical, I did all the knots. I've always had a propensity of woodworking. So my skills as a builder or a carpenter were from a very young age. I buy the trains by the way they look. What I like as far as a style, I like color, of course I'm a Michigan State fan, I love the green, and the steamers, the little Southern Pacific, I just like the way it sounded and the way it looked. So whether it's Lionel, MTH, Williams, I have them all, American Flyer, I've got all the brand names, so I'm not just into one brand name. I bought the El Capitan, and then I bought another set of cars to go with it, aluminum cars. So I can run about 12 or 13 aluminum cars with the El Capitan and I bought a powered, another powered A unit so I, or B unit so I can run A, B, B, A. Uh, I like the aluminum cars, they have a really nice sound, clickety clack sound when they, when they go over the rails. This, the daylight train is just an awesome train. It's brass, it's made by Williams. And then I bought the uh, tender is MTH, the uh, uh, water tender. And the cars that go with it. I like steamers, so I like the crescent, just like the color of it, and the Southern Pacific, I like just the way it sounds. First train I ever got was Boston and Maine, and when I saw that Lionel came out with the Jeeps, I just saw the set and I said, I just gotta have that. I like the colors, I like the way it's set up, and then I got a bunch of box cars that, that match it. And I, I kind of run matching sets, like uh, my Chessie, pulling 26 cars, some, some hoppers, uh, coal cars, some um, tankers, spotlight car. The S-Gage trains, uh, my brother-in-law had the Western. Uh, he sold that to me, and then um, I bought the Crescent. They're all my favorite now. I like them all. I like to switch them out. But pretty much all the trains I bought online. And then there's a few train places in the Detroit metro area that I've purchased track and buildings.
and I had these two huge Hellgate bridges. And then once I laid everything out, I thought, where am I going to put these? Well, what I did to the Hellgate bridges, the ends were closed in. They were all plastic, so I actually cut the ends out of the big spires, both sides, made an archway. Now I run trains over the top, and I run trains through the, th all the way through the Hellgate, and then I, then I built a bridge in between. Bill didn't feel Lionel post-war accessories looked right, so he installed newer MTH and Lionel accessories, like the car wash, Madison Hardware Hobby Shop, McDonald's, and the popular Mel's Drive-In. I'm very pleased. All my neighbors that are here that have the grandkids, they love to come over and watch the trains. It's exciting just to be able to watch their eyes as I run the train. When they first walk in, they're amazed. They've, I've had so many people say, I've never seen anything like this, because they're just not used to model trains. If they were, obviously they would see train layouts bigger than this, but most people it's like, wow. It's just the fascination of watching it going around in circles. It's like watching water. And you just can't get tired of it, and, or watching it snow. I like coming down and sitting and turning off all the lights, watch the passenger trains. Sometimes when the passenger trains go by the wall, they'll make shadows and you'll see the lights flickering. I'll just sit and, and watch, very soothing, hear the click clack of the, of the cars going over the tracks, very soothing. Bill also collects scale die-cast cars. I like die-cast cars. I, I liked the first one, and then I had to have two. And then I saw another one I liked, so I had to have three. And then going online and found out about Danbury Mint and Franklin Mint. 124th scale and 118th scale are my two favorite scales. The engines are detailed. I got all my cars, well, what am I going to do with them? I end up buying a $2,000 cabinet. With, with glass and lights so I can see my cars. So yeah, hobbies are expensive. We're in Grapevine, Texas, where the Lone Star High Railers Model Railroad Club has built their layout inside an old Pullman baggage car. The baggage car is parked behind a 282 Southern Pacific Mikado steam locomotive. For years, the Lone Star High Railers Club has been contributing a large 12-foot wide by 20-foot long portable layout as an attraction for visitors to the Grapevine Vintage Railroad a steam train that provides short excursion rides to and from Fort Worth. The Lone Star High Railers wanted to build a permanent layout in the area, so they approached the Grapevine Convention and Visitors Bureau with the idea. The Bureau agreed and suggested building a layout in a passenger car, but a passenger car has entrances on the ends and the club believed a baggage car would be more suitable as the entrances are on the sides. This would leave the ends available for creating a dog bone layout with large radius curves. The Bureau agreed and a baggage car was acquired, refurbished, and painted. It took the club 18 months to complete the layout. It opened to the public in September 2013 in time for Grape Fest, a large wine festival held downtown. The layout is 65 feet long and 9.5 feet wide on the ends. Along the main line, the layout is 4.5 feet wide, allowing for the aisle for visitors. The layout is powered by two Z4000 MTH transformers. Both MTH's DCS and Lionel's legacy control systems are used to run the trains. 
Gargrave's track is used along with Ross custom switches. On the west end of the car is a large mountain, modeled after a real mountain in West Texas. The multi-level track plan takes trains around and through the mountain. Along the back end, an elevated line spans a river through a trestle bridge. On the ground level, a two-track main line crosses the river over girder bridges. A small town designed to resemble Main Street in Grapevine includes several buildings, vehicles, figures, and trolleys. The trolleys run on super streets, stopping and moving through town. Accessories and buildings include a detailed Lionel Coaling Tower, operating oil derricks and pumps, wind turbines, floodlight towers, an illuminated diner, a model of the B&D Mills concrete grain elevators, and a model of the Grapevine train station. Trains run on this day include a Texas and Pacific steam passenger train. and streamlined passenger trains headed by Santa Fe and Texas Special F3s. A storage yard is located on the east end of the layout, featuring an engine house, roundhouse, and operating turntable. A replica of Grapevine's Mikado and baggage car are located next to the turntable. A toy train layout inside a real baggage car seems appropriate and a great deal for both the town of Grapevine and the Lone Star High Railers Club. Luciani grew up in the Bronx, New York. He had Lionel trains as a kid and built a few basic 4x8 layouts. He graduated from Georgia Tech with a degree in civil engineering, got a job with a large home building company, and moved to Texas. I was a land development engineer. I'm the guy that initiates the projects. We built tens of thousands of houses. Joe traveled the Southwest and discovered great places to watch trains. The Bullion Mountains in California, the Mojave Desert, the Cajon Pass, and the Tehachapi Loop in California. And I became familiar with the operational railroads and what they were doing, like long passing sidings on single track main lines, so I incorporated that. I got familiar with Berlin, New Mexico as the midpoint between Chicago and L.A., how they refueled. I had witnessed Cajon Pass several times, and it's the most enchanting place to watch multiple railroads climbing those hills. And in an hour's time, you can track a train from Hesperia all the way down to San Bernardino. It's just a magnificent thing to see. Images of long Class I freight trains crisscrossing the nation over mountains and through the desert stuck in Joe's mind. And those images became the vision for building his first high rail layout. Joe and his wife Carol moved to Illinois. He designed and built his new home, leaving about 1,800 square feet in the basement to build the layout he had been visualizing for years. It's, it's barren, it's tumbleweed, it's sparse. Part of the layout is just that way. I didn't want to clutter it with all kinds of, of um, structures and stuff. It's barren in places for dozens of miles, 50, 100 miles in places. The concept of the layout was long sidings, long straightaways, continuous loop, and simulate class one operation. Work began on the layout in 2004. 
Joe used his experience in home building in designing bench work that he could walk on. I was going to build a sturdy framework to support my weight, not knowing what the track plan was going to be. What I call a pony wall construction, consisting of a two by four plate, vertical two by four, 16 inch on center with a top plate. And I got two pony walls, 53 inches apart, and spanning that is a two by six construction, 24 inches on center. On top of that, I have three quarter inch plywood and on top of that, I have half-inch homo soap for ease of fastening track and sound deadening. Yes, there were a lot of choices uh, of track that were available to us. I had become friends with John Smith of Pecos River Brass, and he steered me into Atlas Track. And what I liked about them was the simulation of the railroad ties, both concrete and wood. They had flex track, and I thought that was a fit. The track design that I came up with, it's a folded dog bone with six foot diameter turnarounds. It's a continuous loop. If it was unfolded, it would be nearly 90 feet long from end to end. Then I built four ladder track that I turned into a fueling station, which is, simulates Berlin, New Mexico on the BNSF Transcon. In the mid-90s, Joe started buying MTH Proto-1 and Proto-2 scale trains. He also wanted to run his post-war Lionel trains. Uh, since I was accumulating Mike's train house equipment from the mid-90s, it was a given that I would naturally follow into DCS. My concept of the track system, since I had Lionel post-war, PS one and PS2, I designed the electronics so that I could run all three technologies. The problem with the first two technologies, when you hit the direction button with power to the track, what's ever on the track is going to react, and you, we all know with the U units are totally independent, so they'll go one direction or the other, and you can't control them. Therefore, I built in several signal blocks to isolate the track so that if I come into a siding that's not powered, the train entering will stop and avoid a collision. A love-hate relationship developed with MTH. The love was that they were developing what they say is scale, but if you talk to O-scale people, they're, they'll, their stomach will turn because the wheels are not in scale, the couplers are not in scale, blah, 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 and it's three rail, blah, blah, blah. But to me, they were truly in quarter inch per the foot scale, which was realistic enough for me. Little did I know from the late 90s to the early 2000s what technology was gonna bring. And so you're buying stuff, paying top dollar, you come out with the next technology and your product line that you have is worthless. Mike Wolf knew full well what he was ultimately going to do, but as far as the buying public, they were spoon-fed just a little bit at a time, so the, the hate part comes, you're buying stuff and it's going to be obsolete in a matter of minutes, so what good was that? That was a waste of effort, and now they're coming out with reissues of PS2s and 3s, and if you're going to build a big layout, you want more flexibility. If you're just going to have a 4x8 and run it around in a circle, it doesn't matter. To make mountains, Joe first considered the old-fashioned way. I thought, well, we're going to do the paper mache route with uh, the cardboard and dipping stuff in cookie stuff and letting it dry and then painting it. Then Joe discovered a newer method using insulation board. It was so easy to do. I bought inch and a half stock or two inch and half inch, laminated them, and then cut them, made sections, put them into position, posed them to create the uh, scene that I want. Ground cover on that was simple in that I covered the, the styrofoam with plaster wrap and then painted it with earth tone paints 
and then sprinkled on whatever ground cover I, I, I came up with. Joe commissioned a fine artist, Dixie Rogas, to paint his backdrops. Dixie captured perfectly the austere, wide open space look of the Southwest. We did the mountain top outline and then we did the, the ground area and she would put the hard color on there and then she would take a rag, dip it in water and then kind of mute it and it just kind of blended. You, if you look at the mule closely, you will not find very detailed, sharp edges. It's all diffused and it has a tremendous effect. And we did segment by segment. We did probably four areas on the, the mural. It's high rail because that's the way it's defined. It's not O scale because of the uh, trains that run on it are not perfectly scaled. This is a three rail. And speaking of three rail, the Atlas track system has a black center rail. And believe me, when you're watching trains go, you're not looking at the track. In fact, I have walked down the aisles as a tr following the lead engine, and it's a blur. It's just like the real thing. You, you just don't, your eye scans and you don't even see it. So people can get hung up on it as far as the O scale people because it's not like the real thing. And I think that's what separates high rail from O scale. It's scale in proportions, it is operationally correct. There's not as many features as far as accessories that are toy-like. That's not what the real world is like. And again, my layout concept was the barren Southwest with some urbanization in places, and which was infilled based on buildings I had acquired and things that I, I could make a scene out of. Well, with the modern railroads, with the rubber tires, I run 30 car die cast double stacks with three powered units, which again simulates the operational aspect of class one railroads with two on the point, one distributed power. I did not model a particular era. Scenery does not necessarily change, but the railroads have changed. I got diesels from the first generation, the intermediate, and now to the, the tier two environmental. And so I am contemporary, but guess what? The scenery is the same. Those mountains are still the same. They haven't gone anywhere. <laughs> Joe is proud that he got into all phases of layout building and did all the work himself. How about the people that start from scratch, build this with a passion, start to finish? take pride in saying I built this all my own physically, but I've consulted with a lot of people, read a lot of material to find out how the best way to do it, and the results speak for themselves. This is what I do. I'm into trains. <laughs> <laughs>